All right, friends, it's time to give you loyal listeners a discount on protein powder. You may or may not know, but I launched my very first protein powder two years ago. It's a grass-fed beef isolate with only three ingredients, grass-fed beef, either organic cacao or organic vanilla, and organic monk fruit. Now, if you don't want any of the added flavor and sweeteners, you can also just get unflavored. And no matter what flavor you choose, you're getting over 23 grams of protein per scoop, which is gonna keep you full and satisfied between meals. I love starting my day with a Fab Four smoothie and breaking my fast with that much protein. It makes a serious difference in my cravings and blood sugar balance the rest of the day, and I've seen it with my clients as well. Now, I never thought I'd own a product company, but when I got pregnant with Sebastian, I realized the majority of protein powders were chemically extracted or enzymatically extracted, and I wanted to use heat and water only. I wanted minimal ingredients because we don't need those emulsifiers, fillers, or added vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. All of those additions increase the chances that it's not gonna work for your body, whether it be bloating, digestion issues. I just wanted pure clean protein to keep you full and satisfied so you could build the most delicious Fab Four smoothie. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the flavor. If you take a look at our reviews on Amazon, you'll see five-star reviews for flavor. And that is key because if you don't love your Fab Four smoothie and you don't love drinking your protein powder, you're not gonna do it. It won't become a habit and it's consistency that outpaces everything. So. If you're here and you're listening and you want to give our protein powder a try, use the code PODCAST5 for $5 off your order. And let me know if you love it. My favorite ways to apply this protein powder is in my Fab Four smoothie, making freezer fudge, making chocolate milk, making hot chocolate, and throwing the unflavored into all my kids' baked goods. So let me know how you use it. Let me know if you love it. And share this podcast deal with your friends. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Today, I am so excited to welcome Dr. Anthony Gustin. He is the CEO and co-founder of Perfect Keto, one of the fastest growing nutrition companies in the world and the founder of Equip, which was voted best supplement company by Paleo Magazine. Dr. Gustin is also a functional medicine practitioner and a board certified chiropractor who holds a master's of science and a doctorate of chiropractic. His mission is to help people achieve optimal health and well-being through movement, nutrition, stress management, and sleep. And he is also the best-selling author of Keto Answers, which I thought was one of the best blueprints on how to get into keto. It answers all the questions um, that you may have on how to get into ketosis. So I'm so excited to welcome him to the show. Anthony, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, we were just joking that this is Groundhog's Day because I just taped his podcast last week and and here we're back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in the middle of quarantine here, I think that a lot of people are having a pretty similar experience day after day. I just had a friend text me yesterday actually in San Francisco. He had somebody walk up to him and asked him what day it was. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's just like where we're living right now. It's but, true. It's true. Yesterday, my husband, Chris, was like, it feels like it should be Thursday and it's Tuesday. I'm like, I know, babe. We're just it, days are long. It's just <laughs> I don't day. Know what to tell it's you. just day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. How are you protecting your weekends and making sure that you feel like that shutdown is happening? Yeah, the biggest thing is just trying to get off of devices. And so my fiance and I, so we live together, and we obviously do not have any other people basically that we're interacting with. So the thing that we're trying to be most intentional about is just putting our phones in airplane mode or turning them off entirely. And then just doing whatever. So it just depends. Um, last Saturday, it was super rainy. Um, so we were doing a lot of stuff inside. Sunday was really nice. And so we just like left our phones inside the whole time and went out and just explored our neighborhood in ways we hadn't before. So sort of getting creative with how to stay busy. Like We just literally walked around for four hours, <laughs> like looking at houses and exploring the different alleyways and stuff that we had just never been before. Um, so yeah, just trying to get trying to stay fresh, but like not get consumed. I mean, for me, it's just like all work is done via a computer anyways, regardless generally if I am working remote or not. And like having the devices and being bombarded with social media and news stuff, plus work, just shutting all the devices off and getting outside or even staying inside and being creative and just doing something different is the key for us. Definitely. I hear that. We did the same sort of a thing. We walked around the really ritzy neighbor- neighborhood here in Brentwood and we we're like, this is my dream house. No, this is my dream house. <laughs> but it's just like, game, it's huh? like, it's just <laughs> like, it's good to get out. You know, you're like, okay, we got to get creative and do something new. See your city in a whole new way. I totally hear that. It's yeah. been, 
it's been a little bit crazy cooped up in our fishbowl, but um, it, it is. Yeah, and it's like it's it's nice to also just realize that when we don't have devices on for. I don't know. It's after a couple hours. Or you, we just connect in a different way than usually we don't. And so it's like having space like that. Usually we take a trip, you know, every, you know, one to two months. We try to get some time on the calendar where we make sure that we're connecting. And I think it's just a learning that, oh, we can just do this all the time. We just need to be more intentional about it. So when we don't have anything, when you're like, you're, you're trying to connect with somebody and they have a device out even for 30 seconds within an hour and you feel sort of this, the split between connecting with that person. And I think that just doing an entire weekend and doing it at home instead of having to plan this big trip or a getaway or whatever has been really illuminating. What a beautiful lesson that you've learned in your quarantine and and so special. One of, one of many, yeah. yeah. <laughs> one of many. What are some of the other lessons you've learned? Oh, patience, I think is another one. Uh, I'm a very, <laughs> very impatient person and having the ability and freedom to just do whatever I want whenever. And just like my work schedule is usually all over the place. So... I'm in LA, I'm traveling around a lot, doing all these things and being able to do everything and, and letting go and surrendering to the fact that we just have to ride this thing out and I can't fix it for the world. And I think that's sort of a mentality that I, I have, which can be a positive. I think every strength can be negative just when it's um, pushed to the edge. And I think that for sure, like my mindset and, oh, I want to help as many people with you know ketogenic diet or with movement or whatever... You know, with this thing, it's just like there's absolutely like you can help in in very small ways, but you really just have to wait it out and be patient. And especially like when you're locked inside for, I think we're in the going in the fourth week now. Um, but yeah, I mean, just surrendering to it, I think, is a big lesson that I learned. Definitely. Also, uh, yeah, another one would be a power of routine. I mean, I think that like in general, I'm just, I, I don't think I've been, we looked at our calendar since we moved to Austin two years ago. I don't think we've been here for longer than three weeks at a time. And so being locked in our house for the fourth straight week and being here a couple of weeks before that, um, I'm, I'm finally seeing the establishment of routine really paying dividends and allowing me to sort of slip into a sort of mental state that is usually takes me a little bit more to warm up for. Um, as well as just like having the comfort and routine of... I mean, we talked a little bit before the show. Of, you know, wake up, journal, meditate, do some movement, probably work out, and then making breakfast tacos every single day. So not in ketosis currently, but shifting towards eating more carbs. We can dig into that a little bit later in the show. But even doing that and then going to work, just having that consistency every single day, is something that I, I, I haven't had in probably four or five years. And you know, when I had my clinic in San Francisco and I was doing that, it was very routine based, and I sort of forgot how how validating and, and how great it is to have something you should do every single day and slip into the same mind, mindset and just be productive. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been great. It's amazing how a routine can make you make your, calm your central nervous system and really make you oh, totally. feel productive and and able to like it's it's almost like working out like if you're working out every day you you can really dip into that strength so much faster than if it's like weeks at a time between workouts or it's 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 that way with everything we do right yeah all these things this is like long term cumulative momentum. Whether it's meditating, working out, eating well, things with routine, etc., like all these things, you know, you look back four weeks, like, oh man, this is this is very different than week one, yeah. You know? And I think that routine allows that, you know, those momentums to speed up a little bit more. I love it. Well, you s- sort of touched on it. Um, your past life as a, a chiropractor and a practicing functional medicine practitioner in San Francisco and how you're new to Austin. But will you take us back and tell us about your journey from um, being in practice to owning Perfect Keto and what your life looks like now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's been... I've had a lot of past lives, I feel like at this point. I'm just about to turn 32. So it's... you know, I wonder how many future lives I'm going to have. <laughs> sort of something I joke about all the time. But I mean, I was, I was really unhealthy growing up. And I grew up in the Midwest, in Minnesota, and sort of in a lower middle class family. We didn't have much education and just like eating toaster strudels and like I hid Doritos under my bed because like my family like couldn't afford much food. But when we did, we got junk food, I would stash it. And so I could eat them alone in my bed, which is sort of sad. And I don't know why I'm telling this story. But yeah, that's sort of like how I I was raised on nutrition. Uh, Lo and behold, that led to me being really sick. And I mean, just gut, gut problems, acne, Really overweight, and just figured out when I was in high school and started learning about science. I'm like, oh, wait, you can affect your body and you can change it. And so, just sort of at that point, 
knew that there had to be sort of a better way to doing things and figured out by myself just reading textbooks basically how to lose fat and like sort of going against traditional wisdom and in heading more towards eating real foods at that point it was more like you know, whole grains low fat etc i think that everybody at that point was trying to be healthy was doing that same thing yeah been there um, done that <laughs> and totally i think yeah everybody sort of has their own journey but i think that there's there's consistent marks through of like eating processed food then you probably you go low fat high grain etc um, which worked for controlling a lot of weight for me and then it was just, you know, I knew that I wanted to help people with their health and their own journey. And at that point, growing up, the only thing I knew how to do was be a healthcare provider. So I, I figured out with a lot of family friends who were in healthcare that I also wanted to own my own business and work on people in a preventative way. Instead of, you know, I had a family friend who was an orthopedic surgeon and they always were f- fixing people after they were broken and had no help with being like, hey, here's, this, here's how you establish new routines to prevent you from being this you know, as is. And also, you know, I'm sort of very particular with how I spend my time. So I wanted to own my own business and have my own clinic and do things my own way. And working for a hospital system is not the way I wanted to do it. So there's there's very few options if you want to do all of those things and sort of have a broad scope of practice. So sort of fast track to uh, being a chiropractor. So getting my doctor in chiropractic and also wanted to work with high end athletes. So sort of thinking about the model of, you know, and I put this in the book, I think that like I always think like working with the highest end population, you learn the most because people are pushing things at the at the, the end. But like, so for instance, like NASCAR is something where these cars are tweaked just to an infinite degree to try to get like a half mile faster over the you know the course of a four hour race or something like that. All that stuff trickles down to consumer cars. And the same thing with working with pro athletes is when people are trying to get the highest amount of performance out of their body, you can learn a lot there that trickles down and, and see consistent things that maybe an average Joe, you wouldn't be able to see sort of the, the delta of change. And so that's sort of the goal of my practice when I first launched it was, and this was in 2012, is like, yeah, how can I work with the highest end people to learn as much as humanly possible? And then take that and apply it at scale towards you know everybody who can learn from it. And so that yeah, you know, is a is a hell of a journey. I mean, we launched a clinic and then scaled it to six locations within I think two or three years. So we're getting a lot of high end athletes and started working with um, you know mostly musculoskeletal injuries, people who are having hamstring injuries, you know, torn rotator cuffs, all this stuff, rehabbing, and then started you know once we got a system around that, we switched to doing more internal stuff. So figuring out like looking at lab markers, doing more functional medicine work. So. This whole switch. I mean, I don't think the body is just one thing where you look at something in in isolation. I think that the physical body, internally and externally, make a lot of sense when looking at it together. So I always wanted to sort of pair together. Oh, my arm hurts here, or my leg hurts there. With I'm having these digestive issues, and no matter what, the most consistent thing that I saw was that nutrition was the biggest lever to pull when looking at someone's overall health, whether it is healing from any hamstring injury or fixing their gut. And so I was telling people over and over and over again, okay, you guys, you need to, you know, whether it was a mom who's working at home who had gut issues versus an NFL wide receiver who's an all pro who wants to, you know, run a little faster, is like, you need to focus on your nutrition. This is the biggest thing that I kept telling people over and over and over again. And I sort of have my Fab Four, which is like you alluded to before nutrition, movement, stress management, slash like relationships and sleep. And nutrition by far is the largest lever that I see people pull. And so I started in my patient visits, which were you know like forty five minutes to an hour long. I I kept going over because I kept saying the same nutrition principles over and over and over again. Which are a lot of things that I learned sort of through my own journey. I mean, we can get to a lot of what I think about and how to think about these frameworks regarding nutrition. But in general, you know, eat, eating real food first is the biggest thing. And you know, everybody has their definition of what real is, and I can get into mine in a little bit, but. That was just a, a conversation that I wanted to stop having on repeat. It felt like a broken record. So I started yeah. writing articles and posting them online and then realized, oh man, there's a way to help people beyond just seeing them one on one because people started reading this stuff from all over the place. And so you know, I think the first couple of articles, are, I'm still getting a lot of traffic from this is like six, seven years ago, which is like how to, how to cook eggs for maximal nutrition. It's like ranking the the way you cook eggs and like thinking about science and how things get oxidized to like preserve fat and nutrition in the yolks, but also you know having the protein cooked so you don't have problems in the egg. I mean, this is like 
that type of stuff all the way getting to like into how the nitty source. gritty. <laughs> yeah. But like give it in a practical way of like, okay, here like if you want to know how to like the soft boiled eggs is like the best way. Yeah. Okay, and then this and then that. You know, and then so like this is sort of like giving people, yes, the science behind it so they actually understand and build a framework themselves over time, but also giving them practical takeaway knowledge. And I think this is the biggest thing in healthcare that we miss is giving people actual tools of what to do. I mean, so often people go to a doctor, whether it's for knee pain or for diabetes or whatever, and they're just rubbed on or given some shot or given a prescription medication and they're not given anything actionable that they can do. They're not empowered at all. And I think that's the, the saddest part. And like we see so much chronic disease in our society right now. Um, getting sort of off track here, but I mean, it's no, going it's, back like I, yeah, I mean, this is something that, you know, just started. Writing and writing and writing and realizing that like, oh man, people all around the world are reading this stuff. It's crazy. Like this is how the internet works. Which is like, you know, I was in San Francisco. I didn't even know how online marketing and internet worked before <laughs> that. Um, and then, you know, built up a little audience and then started asking them what they had trouble with. It was consistent with a lot of things regarding uh, the patients that I was working with. It was just general like people, you know, a lot of high-end athletes, but they were taking supplements that were just complete garbage. And so like really processed dairy products pre-workouts that had all these artificial ingredients and flavorings in them. And when we took them out, they would feel better, but then they would have problems performing because they want, you know, I think supplementation is something that is exactly what the word says. It's, it's not a replacement for food, but it is supplemental it can be a, a huge help for a lot of people. And so launched uh, Equip Foods, which is the, you know, one of the companies that you're talking about in the intro that was sort of a, the purpose of that was to provide people with a little bit of awareness and the feedback loop of what they put in their body. And so what I mean by that is when, we provided people better products than what they were taking. For instance, we have a grass-fed beef isolate protein powder that's just grass-fed beef, like whole chunks of the animal. So we use the muscle meat, like every, basically we chop off the the cows into quarters and then cook them sort of like a like a bone broth, and then put that into a powder, and then just add cocoa powder and stevia. So there's no weird ingredients. And when I was first trying to formulate this stuff, in the first uh, order that I had of, of this inventory, I got and it was the weight was off. It was supposed to be like, it was supposed to be 454 grams per pound, and it came like 485 grams or something like that. And I called the manufacturer. I was like, what, what is going on here? This is like, you guys feel this wrong. And lo and behold, and this is what happens a lot in this industry, is that they add in extra fillers, binding agents, stabilizers, et cetera, that are just sort of a stock, uh, mostly so that their machines, the manufacturer's machines, run better. And so they have to clean them less. Because if you, are mixing stuff together and especially putting them in the capsules or whatever, you basically need something called an excipient to get them through some of the machines. Um, so that was a lesson learned. Um, I mean, I put like everything, like all the money I had at the time on and like credit cards, to, like order this stuff and then it came completely ruined. Uh, it was tragic and really, really stressful, but got through it. So if you give people somebody like something like this that doesn't actually have all this crap on it, which you don't have to put on the label, actually, which is the thing that a lot of people don't know either, is that all these things are in such small amounts that right. you don't actually have to disclose them on the label, but they do affect your body in different ways. And so right. they can attach to your gut lining, ruin your gut. Um, I mean, like, like things like, for instance, like, I, I don't know, like micro, um, like micrograms of LSD is like people, like if they've done any sort of psychedelic drugs or not, I mean, you know the stories of people having crazy, crazy experiences. This is in micrograms, microgram amounts right. that blow people's minds apart. And so if you think that like things like that cannot affect you in gram amounts, then you're sort of like, you're missing out quite a bit on a lot of the things that could be impacting you and your health that you're just not sure of. And so providing these things to people is sort of like a, a gateway drug, I would say, to being able to understand how nutrition affects them and their body. And so when you give people beef protein, instead of having like a processed whey with a bunch of artificial things in it, they go, oh man, I feel way better after I drink this other than that one. And it tastes good. And so you start giving people this motivation to look into, okay, how should it be changing my nutrition and behavior around food? Like, oh, the food that I put in my body actually does matter. I, like, I'm recovering faster, I'm less sore, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, after that, I just saw and learned a lot from the people I was with in San Francisco that, okay, now you can do that. And then you can use content and emails and social media and all those things to, to educate people beyond just the product that you're selling them. And so people start using products, they're having really good, they, they replace garbage products, they're, they're feeling really good. 
you're motivated to get better. And then you can create this sort of ecosystem of education around it where people can learn about real nutrition without having to sit with them for an hour at a time and explain to them, hey, this is why this is important, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I mean, it was just sort of the, this, this big realization that I had going through that process of, oh, I can do all this work, build a team and start doing these products and creating these brands that can help many, many people when I'm sleeping and when I'm doing whatever. And that before the model of you know, working with patients one-on-one as a clinician, which I do miss for sure, um, it was just sort of... Every time I left the room, I was like, okay, now that's one person. And then who knows if they take that information or not. And that, that work that I did with that one patient was just gone at that point. And right. so doing work that sort of lasts and is, you know, I could get hit by a bus tomorrow or, you know, succumb to whatever disease and, and, and be food for the worms and like all this stuff and all this work that we have now can still work and be learned by, like people can learn by this stuff and it can help a lot of people moving forward. So that's just sort of the model that I personally favor. And so as I was sort of like figuring this out, I was still running Equip and then in my clinic. Um, ketogenic diet was something that was coming up a lot. I had actually used it in undergrad in like 2008, 2009 is when I first started getting into it. Um, I was starting to see though that a lot of patients were responding to it really, really well. It was something I was using, I think like 2014, 2015, a lot in my clinic. Um, there's still a lot of problems though. And I think there still is regarding like the ease of use of getting into ketosis. So at this point, this is like late 2015, early 2016 that I was like, okay, there's, there's like a huge problem here. People are starting to hear about this a little bit more. We're using it as a therapy. But generally speaking, the education is just like, there was no articles online written at this point. There were no products. Like right now, it's like super easy to go in a grocery store and find keto-friendly products. At that point, there was nothing. And there was also like uh, just a lot of confusion around, you know, is this, is, is this keto? Is this not keto? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's like all of these things where people had trouble getting into ketosis, staying ketosis, having credible information. And so that's when we launched uh, Perfect Keto. So it was sort of the same model that I had learned with Equip. It's like, okay, you can launch this stuff, help people out and create this platform of education that you know, we've done over the last three years and you know, really help guide this. You know, it exploded, obviously, is a, is a huge, huge trend in, in the last three, four years. And like, help guide this thing to where it is. Like, I think there's like, so many pitfalls in a ketogenic diet. I think it's still really, really confusing for people wanting to pick it up. Um, yeah, that was... Um, so we launched Perfect Keto a little under... A little over three years ago, and I left my clinic like three, like right before we launched Perfect Keto, just because I knew that it was okay. gonna be a whale. <laughs> well, it was just I, I only have at, at that point I was running like four or five businesses. I clinic one of them, Equip Foods, one of them, and I knew like okay, if I'm gonna take on this extra business, like I, I have to remove something from my life, and I just knew that like okay, this model where I spend work, work time, and then like it can help people in a compounding rate if I'm not working or not. Uh, if I'm working or not, then like I want to focus more on that type of a business than seeing people one on one. And so made that shift that summer, which was a huge identity shift. I think from like being, I mean, it's like that's what I wanted to do since I was young. I went through you know tons of student loan debt, obviously, like going through grad school, being known as this person who does this thing, to shifting to doing what I'm doing now is a very very different. It's a different mindset. It's a different work day. It's a different team. It's it's a whole different everything. Um, so certainly a little bit challenging, but. I mean, I think that it was the right decision looking back on it as far as like how I want to have impact on the world. I mean, we've had a lot of amazing response, like 150 million page views on our website with our content. Um, the, obviously, like, what is it? Like 1,500 to 2,000 articles that we've done, all these products. People have sent us just amazing stories. And I mean, that, that's just the work that I'm interested in. And I would say, like, just starting to scratch the surface from like, how we can help people from a from like a, a platform standpoint as well. Well, you're definitely helping obviously millions of people if you're getting that many views and you have products to support them to do that. So I guess I'm curious, you touched on it a little earlier. What what is your food philosophy and how does ketosis play a role in your life? Yeah, so I think with all those things like I talked about, like the four like pillars of health that I think there are some constants. And then after that, you have a lot of tweaking to do to figure out what's what's best for you. And so what I mean by that is with nutrition, again, like eating real food is paramount. Like no one can no no one can argue with with me or you or anybody else that eating a Pop Tart is better than eating 
a, a, you know, a piece of celery or something like that. You know, like eating stuff that's spoiled is always better than eating processed food. After you have that framework, though, I think that there's a lot of leeway in you know the timing of food, how much you eat, macronutrient composition, etc. I think a lot of that has to play in with your genetic history, but also your environmental history. So ketogenic diet works really, really well for me because I used to be really overweight. And I think that people, when they have, you know, when you look in a natural state of a human being, like you're not sick, you're not overweight. I, natural state of every organism this is why I read in my podcast, this is, is health. And, you know, you, you don't walk around and see sick animals running around even in the city. It's like if, if you were to walk outside and be walking down the sidewalk and you see a squirrel coming up and it's like four times the size of what a squirrel, what a squirrel should like, you'd be like, what the hell is going on? Like, what is wrong with this animal? Right. And we just we don't have that same mindset here um, with human nutrition and human health and, and figuring out like where people are at. So I think people deviate a lot from that natural state. When you do so, sometimes you need tools to get back to that natural state. And so if I was, for instance, to be walking around outside and I tripped off of a curb and sprained my ankle, okay, it'd be like six to eight weeks and I'd be able to walk completely fine. My ankle function would be, would be great. And so, but that would be like a, uh, I would say, a deviation from the natural state of your, you know, your anatomy. If I was walking off that same curb and my ankle got r- ran over by a bus, well, now that <laughs> is going to take way different. You, you might need a surgery, you might need crazy rehab, and your ankle might never function the same way again. I think that when you look at that from a, like, from an inner point of view, from your body on the inside, the same thing can happen from a metabolic standpoint. And so if you treat your metabolism terribly for 15, 20, 30 years, I mean, in my case, about 10 years, where you're just jamming all this processed food, these amounts of carbohydrates that are not natural, not getting sunlight, not doing this thing, taking antibiotics, like pretty much a classic um, standard American diet with not a lot of movement, terrible sleep, a lot of stress, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have a you have a point where you're so far from baseline, you sort of need some extra tools to get back to that direction. And a ketogenic diet is just a way with how much we've created an artificial environment with our food. So many people are non metabolically broken, which lead to obesity, diabetes, a lot of other chronic diseases. And ketogenic diet is just one tool to get people back to that point. It's not the only tool. It's not what every human should be doing. If it works for you, that's great. I think that. Humans can eat carbohydrates. I don't think that they're the devil. I think a lot of people in the, in the keto space, sort of in any space, really, like, then say, find something that works for some people. They try to apply it as a panacea to every single person on earth. And I don't really think that's the case. I think that with nutrition, after you get through this framework of real food, then you can start looking at things like, you know, when do I eat? Do I, do, do I fast? Do I eat more carbs? When we eat more fat, et cetera. But it's just a really good tool for getting people back to the baseline from how far they've deviated. Um, from the natural state, if that makes sense, it absolutely does. Is that what is that the tool that you use to sort of bring your your body back after all of the Doritos? Yeah, and I, <laughs> I think that even for now, so I've been experimenting a little bit with adding carbs in just to see. Like I've been eating eating more than like twenty thirty grams of carbs in a day for like four years or so, and like I had, I had gone sort of in and out of ketosis for a while, but now it's been a point where. I just want to see how flexible my metabolism is and just do some more experiments mm-hmm. and really test how I respond to certain carbohydrates. Um, I've been increasing my exercise in my workouts a lot recently and I've noticed that eating more carbohydrates for me works really well. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, yes, my performance is up. I was having some issues with hunger and just feeling a little bit lethargic. Those things are fixed. I mean, some of the things we can dive into hormones regarding ketosis in a little bit, but these things, I think, over the course of four years, while also having stress in your body, and like I think that being in a state of ketosis is like a, a very low level stress. Just like fasting would be, just like a sauna would be, just like a workout would be, just like you know all these things that are really good stresses. Eating vegetables, I think, are stresses to a to a good degree. Um, I think that like I had so much stress burdened on my plate over the last year plus with work and a lot of personal stuff. Plus, working a lot, a lot, and like doing all of these things, caffeine, etc. That I'm, I'm trying to just pull back a little bit and give my body as much of an, a state of abundance as possible, so it can just sort of thrive. And I tell you one thing: like I, I do not look as lean as I did when I was on a ketogenic diet, and that is something like I'm just tweaking with things that are important to me. And I think that this is the important part as well. Of uh, people should like really, really, I urge them to have a north star regarding what's important with them with health. Like, is it the most important thing? Is it losing fat? 
Is it reducing your risk of cancer? Is it performing at a high level because you're a pro athlete? Is it convenience because you have a lot of kids at home and you're trying to do a lot of things? Is it focus for work to get a lot of productivity done? Like having sort of a prioritization in your mind of what is important to you will really help you put into place these tools when it comes to exercise, nutrition, sleep, etc. You can kind of prioritize what works for you. But I think for a lot of people, it's just to not be sick and to yeah. not be overweight and to not be obese. And I think that there's a lot of... like To have lower amounts of inflammation. And like yeah. for me, that was the case for a long period of time. And it was also to get a lot of work done. And for me, nothing replaces that like a ketogenic diet. So now I use a, you know, we, you can take our, one of our products is called a, an exogenous ketone, which is just the ketones that your body will break down from fat. You can take as a supplement as well. So now I do that in, instead of just being in keto, the state of ketosis all the time. And I get similar benefits when I'm working doing that, but it's not this, like I don't get, a, I don't get all of the benefits of lowered inflammation which is like, I'd say still pretty low, but I can just tell when I work out, I don't recover as fast. Um, but I'm, I'm overall resting way more and I'm having more energy, et cetera. So there's, a, there's certainly a balance to these things. Yeah, it's funny when I think about what my North Star might be and what I really like to focus on, it would just be like a vibrant, energetic, like pain-free life that yeah. you know I'm able to focus and constantly learn and, and share that education with the world. You know, So it's... It is, it is so important to have that outside of just like body composition goals. And we can get caught in that loop of like, I want to be this size. I want to look this way. My whole life will be better if I'm exactly this. And that can be, that can really like take, create a burden in your life. And I'm, I'm so glad that you're talking about that because it's such a really big theme. Um, I think with my audience and like with um, the women I work with and just, it's just so, so important. So, and I love that you say that ketosis is a tool and not for everyone, but I would love for you to explain ketosis because I think that like the myths out there and the misunderstanding is just run rampant. Um, yeah, so, so will you explain like the, <clears throat> the biological process of getting into nutritional ketosis, how it works, um, how you test if you're in it, how you personally test, what you're looking for on um, numbers, if you're using a ketometer, or, you know, pee strips, you know, how long it might take people to get into it. Like, give us the nitty gritty. Okay, that's a lot of information, but I'll, I'll do my best to, to summarize it. So, a lot of people think that you need to have an excess of fat to be in ketosis, and this is actually not true. The only thing you need to do is basically limit the amount of carbohydrates you consume. Um, there's another misconception here that you, you know, if you eat too much protein, then you're also not going to be in ketosis. And I, I don't believe in that either. I mean, ask anybody on a carnivore diet what their ketone levels are, and they'll say very, very high, even though they're eating 180, 190, 200 grams of protein in a day. So really, the only thing you need to worry about is constricting um, and, and like really removing carbohydrates from your nutrition. When you do that, you, um, you, your body basically runs primarily on one of two energy fuels. And so either running on carbohydrates or you're running on ketones. And ketones are just the breakdown of fatty acids. So triglyceride goes to the liver, breaks down and produces these things called ketones. So you write ones on the free fatty acids that are chopped from the triglyceride, but it also runs on the byproduct of that, which are ketones. So, but basically running on, you know, just how carbohydrates break down to glucose, your, your body can and will use that. So does the body run on fats breaking down to fatty acids, free fatty acids, as well as ketones. And there's just your your body's always going to use a blend of these things. So it's never another misconception is that you're only burning one or the other. I mean, if you're in ketosis, which you know, there's three main ways to measure that we'll get into in a second. You are still like if you test your blood sugar in that, your blood sugar doesn't go to zero. So you still need blood sugar to be used in, in a lot of critical functions in your body. But there's a certain homeostasis there that your body can regulate the balance between using fat for energy and um, carbohydrates for energy. I don't think carbohydrates are bad, but I think that a lot of people have, have lost the way to use them appropriately for fuel or are not getting them in an appropriate source. Uh, so when you restrict carbohydrates for... Again, this depends on how broken your metabolism is. Like this is the point that a lot of people call the keto flu. So imagine taking away your main energy fuel source. Well, if you have never gone without carbohydrates or have not fasted for a really long period of time, your body literally can't make ketones effectively. So there are certain transporters on your cells called monocarboxylic uh, transporters that suck in ketones after your body produces them. Your cells don't have that many of them if you've gone your whole life eating a ton of carbohydrates. And so basically you're restricting one fuel source, but 
and then producing the other one, but you can't use the ketones effectively when you first get on a ketogenic diet. So from anywhere between like five days to like 20, 21 days or so, this thing called the keto flu can happen, which is yes, a, a reduction in um, energy source, but you can ameliorate that with additional MCTs or exogenous ketones. Also, there's some biological things that happen. Your, your um, insulin levels really, really go low, which is a good thing. But what happens is that transiently dumps a lot of sodium and electrolytes. And so having a low amount of electrolytes in this stage can also wreak havoc on your body. And so most of the effect that people think of like a keto flu is actually due to lower electrolytes, but also due to this sort of energy system going haywire. Um, once you get, get sort of what's called fat adapted, which means that your body can use the ketones effectively, then it's like for a lot of people, like the lights turn on for the first time and yeah. they feel crazy, like limitless energy, really great mental focus, like hunger levels completely plummet and inflammation levels, recovery, everything improves dramatically. And that is a great place to be. I mean, I think like once you're there for then I'd say like four to six months, then you can start using carbohydrates and going back and forth. So right now, for instance, last night, I am eating quite a lot of carbohydrates, you know, 75 grams, 100 grams, whenever I'm like in the day, I usually do not have ketones in my bloodstream. But the, this morning I woke up, tested, and I had, you know, 1.2 millimoles in my blood. And we'll get to measurement in a second. But I was in ketosis when I woke up. So now that my body had been in ketosis for so long, I can eat carbohydrates. But then when I'm not with carbs for a little, little bit, my body will start using fat, breaking it down, and sort of like going back and forth between these energy systems. Again, if you've never done this in your life, your body's not going to have the ability to switch from one energy source to the other one. And, that, and that's problematic. And this is why so many people have a hard time fasting as well. Uh, so that's where like the, the very basic stuff and then how you would test it would be three different ways. And so you can test it via your breath, via your urine, or via your blood. And so when you produce ketones for the first time, you know, most people are probably familiar with a, with a pee strip. And so you pee on, like they spill over to your urine and you pee on a strip and then it, there's a color that it tells you, okay, you have either zero or the spectrum. You're peeing yeah. purple or not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, how many like photos of people's pee that I've gotten over the last couple of years? <laughs> like, hey, am I getting ketosis or not? Um, and yeah, so this is good when you're first getting started. But when your body starts becoming accustomed to, to actually soaking these things up in your cells and using them for energy, then you're not spilling them out into your urine. And your body sort of titrates. Oh, I need this much ketones for my cells. I'm going to make that much ketones for my cells. And so you stop spilling them over into your urine. A lot of people, when they're used to doing these strips, will go, oh, dang, I'm not in ketosis anymore because my levels are going down. That's just an illusion because your cells are using them for energy instead of them spilling over to your urine. So good in the beginning, not good long-term. But they're really cheap. So it's like you know seven bucks for 100 strips, something like that. Um, Breath is something that I think that there's a lot of companies trying to figure this out in a consistent way. I've tried a lot of them and I'm not too impressed with consistency. They're also, they take forever and they're really expensive devices. Um, so your same thing though, when you pee out ketones, you also breathe out acetone, which is a byproduct is another sort of ketone. And th that can be done. I'm not a huge fan of it um, for a lot of different reasons, like, like I mentioned before. Um, the third one is blood. So you can just like a diabetic would prick their finger and check their glucose levels, their blood glucose. You can do the same thing with ketones. And so sort of a similar thing happens here where this is measured on millimolars. Um, and so the same thing happens here where in the beginning, when you start testing it, you'll probably see it in your urine, but won't see it as much in your blood. Then you'll see it more in your blood and you'll sort of peak out at this four to six month rate like I was talking about. And then when you start putting all these ketones into your cells for energy... Again, you, you'll still see levels of um, ketones in your bloodstream. They'll just go down further. So when somebody's adapting to keto for the first time, maybe they'll, over the course of three weeks, go from zero millimolars up to two, 2.5, three. And then after that, after a couple of weeks more, it decreases to like 1.5, 0.8, etc. And that's completely fine. And like, there's not, it's not like a, if more ketones, you're burning more fat or doing more whatever. It's just you, your body sort of has a, a regulation standpoint. It's just sort of like with blood glucose, you want it low and you want the area in the curve to be low after you eat foods, but you don't want to go to zero. Right. It's sort of like a, you know, if it's between like 70 and 90, great. Same thing with ketones. If it's between 
0.5 and 3, great, but more isn't better. Just like lower isn't always better for blood sugar. It's almost just like, it's like what we're going through now. We're just trying to flatten the curve and low that, <laughs> create, exactly, yeah. create a rolling wave. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think um, I tried some of those, um, I want to call them breathalyzers back in the day. Um, and I actually used ketosis a little bit in 2014 and 2015 with some guys getting ready for the X-Men movie. And, but I used it with men more than I ever used it with women. And it was really like pretty specific about the people that I, they used it with. Um, but I definitely think it's a tool that people can use and see so much success. Um, but I like the way that you're using it. So sort of like using it to, as a tool to, f- to fix some metabolic dysfunction and then kind of testing your body and where it's at. And it, and it sounds like it's working beautifully for you. The fact that you can get away with 75 to 100 grams of carbohydrates and wake up with ketones in your blood is, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think that one of the biggest things is that people don't, like if they're metabolically healthy, they don't, like you don't need to do a ketogenic diet to lose fat. I think that this is sort of like, because we've seen so many people who are metabolically broken and obese lose a lot of fat by getting their metabolism to a better point. We sort of like now have this public opinion that you must do keto to lose fat. And it's just not true. Like we, if you're metabolically healthy, you can do a lot of different things to lose fat and eating carbohydrates can be one of them. It's just a really, a really effective tool. If you've like, you know, I think like if no one's been in ketosis before, I think it's good for everybody to experience it in some way or another. And if that's through fasting for a long period of time, a couple of days, or through, you know, I mean, ketosis was, was designed originally as a way to mimic fasting for, for children with epilepsy. And so you can mimic fasting as well, but then you're still getting a lot of calories. And so your body doesn't go in this crazy starvation mode, and which can be great, especially for women. I think that the, the biggest downfall of keto for women that I see is that now that the ketones themselves are being ketosis is bad, but it's so satiating of a diet that people will tend, if they're not tracking their food, especially when they start a ketogenic diet, it is so hard to eat enough food. And this is one of the things that I think that it was tr- uh, troubling for me as well over the last year or so. Like I think I was just under eating for a year. Right. And I think that it's easier for men to to eat enough food in general. I think that women struggle with a lot of with a lot of societal things, a lot of just expectations around, you know, when you're out to eat, how much food is socially acceptable to be eaten. And so it's like okay for the for a for a guy to be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna eat all this stuff and eat everybody else's leftovers. And like that's just that's some for some reason not cool for a woman to do. And mm-hmm. so we have that, but we also have just it's literally it really difficult when you're eating whole foods that are high in fat to eat enough food, especially if you're working out. Right. So what I see with a lot of women is that they try to load up on exercise, intense exercise, like CrossFit or something like that, or like really crazy boot camps, one or two a day. OTF or berries or something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, then, and then also do some fasting, intermittent fasting, and then also do ketogenic diet, and then also do calorie restriction. And I think that it's, just, it's too much and it's a recipe for disaster. Um, I think that women are far more susceptible to hormonal problems from that sort of mix of a storm than men are. And yeah, I mean, I've seen it in both. But it, yeah, it's something that like, it's, it's just really, really challenging to eat enough when you're eating real foods. Right. So what would you say, what are some of the hormonal disruptions that you've seen when someone gets into ketosis and how can we avoid those? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's sort of two different hormonal changes that go on. One is natural and normal, and one is abnormal. That just takes a little longer. So the first one is thyroid and sex hormones will, if you take lab markers eating carbohydrates versus being fat adapted, you'll have a shift and they'll be lowered when you're in ketosis compared to baseline if you're eating carbohydrates. And that, that's just because the pathways, like you just basically need less hormone to do the same job as before because you, your body's just running on a different energy system. Then you start to have way more problems long-term if you're under eating. And this isn't due to ketosis in general, but again, just chronically underfeeding can lead mm-hmm. to even more suppression in those hormones that is abnormal. And so the, 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 it's, it's not, I, I would say like people, a lot of, there's a lot of misconception out there that ketosis leads to the problems that I've seen people who have been on ketosis, had their hormones, especially their sex hormones and their thyroid hormones be all messed up for like after four to six months of under eating and then they stay on ketosis and then eat you know almost two x the, the amount they're eating before 
and those hormones sort of balance out and, and establish a better homeostasis. I've had a client who went on ketosis and lost her period, but it was it was absolutely related to under eating, and and I I found that increasing her protein intake really brought all of her hormones back into balance as well. So yeah, I mean that that's probably the number one mistake that people do when they go on a ketogenic diet. I would say is is not increasing or keeping protein high enough. And I think that the sort of the it must just be high fat, low protein, low carb. Yeah, is a misconception. I actually prefer it to be high protein, moderate fat, low carb, especially if somebody's trying to switch the metabolism over to burning more fat. Same. You're just all of those bioavailable amino acids and B vitamins and iron and all of it. Like it really does change energy levels as well. So that's great. Um, from your personal experience, um, like how many carbohydrates can people get away with when they're trying to get into ketosis or stay in ketosis? Um, what, what's been, has there been a sweet spot for you or do you find yeah. that everyone's different? Yeah, this, I mean, this is entirely dependent on the individual, their lifestyle, their metabolic history, et cetera. And then also not even their metabolic history as it is right now, but how it is after they get fat adapted. So, I mean, four years ago when I was doing this, there's no way I could have tested having ketones in my bloodstream after eating 100 carbs a day um, the day before, for example. And I think that that changes over time. But I think for like a general rule of thumb, anywhere between 25 and 50 to get started for people. I mean, again, like the, the individual, like if you're a... Uh, 110 pound female versus a 300 pound male, like different ages, is like very, very different. You know, right. as far as what amount of carbohydrates can go where, like what workouts you're doing, how much glycogen is being replenished. Um, but yeah, I would say about 25 to 50 if you're not doing a lot of activity, and then that sort of goes up to about you know 50 to 75 if you're doing a lot of explosive activity, and then the timing of that really matters as well. So. If you're eating a lot of carbohydrates around a workout, you'll stay in ketosis more because all that stuff's basically going to be soaked up as a sponge into your muscles. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot you can do with, you know, if you want to eat carbohydrates, but still, still stay on a ketogenic diet, it's not like you have to go all the way to zero. And this right. is an, another thing that people think like, oh, I can't have any of these things at all. And even when I was in full ketosis and not eating a lot of carbohydrates, I was eating a sweet potato a day and you know, it's not much, it's like 20, 25 grams of carbs. But with that, I had, you know, something after a workout, I had absolutely zero problems saying ketosis at that point. Right. So were you carb backloading post workout and were you having that um, carb, that sweet potato with other macronutrients or on its own? What was your kind of, um, your, your special sauce? Yeah, I usually I have that with a steak or some source of meat, like 10 to 12 ounces of meat. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, pretty pretty basic thing. Yeah, I'm very very. I, got, I like to cook and I like to make things that are amazing, but I'm also like very very basic with how I eat. It's like whatever is like produce fresh from there's a farm like not even a mile from our house. Like you know whatever is local and seasonal there. Plus you know about a pound and a half, two pounds depending on the workout day of meat. Of again, lo local stuff or stuff that I've hunted, and then whatever carbohydrate source now that I add on top of that. So it's just very, very basic. That's it. I'm moving to Austin. <laughs> Great place. I'm like, uh, it's it's only nine fifty in the morning, and I'm like, a, like just a beautiful piece of steak and sweet potato sounds so good to me right now. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, you know, I think what you we were talking about and I talked about in the intro is nutrition is this pillar for you, quote unquote, part of your fab four, but you know, stress management, sleep, relationships, and movement um, are so much a part of the picture when it comes to building a holistic, like vibrant life of wellness. Um, what advice do you have for people like kind of just getting started and trying to have that type of a life? Where would you start? And what do you think are like the biggest um, where, where can you get the biggest bang for your buck? Yeah. So I think that it's really easy to get obsessed with one of these things and forget about all the other ones. And so I think that when, when thinking about this, I think about it sort of like as legs in a chair. And so if you have a chair that has one leg that's made out of like a spaceship style titanium alloy, and I'm sitting in a, like a stool with one leg on it, and it's like I've maxed out the best it could possibly be. And you come up to me and try to push me over. Like I'm, I'm very susceptible to, to whatever <laughs> nudge you give to me. Right. But if I, if I have, you know, I've whittled out and carved out four really solid legs out of wood, 
compared to these like titanium alloy. And I'm like, I'm on a chair with four legs. Come and try to push me over. It's a very different story. And then people try to obsess with getting each of these things or one of them to 100%, 99% perfection before addressing the other things. And I think that once you're at 80% and you have like sort of a good paradigm on how you eat nutrition and how you approach food and you're not tempted by a lot of things and you're just eating real food and, and you're just like, okay, good. Now moving on to other things, I think is is a smart move and, and like doing that and like getting everything sort of level and then going back and then you know tweaking and, and growing. And I think that you know the journey never ends. Like I'm always tweaking with stuff on myself. Um, and I think that like looking at movements, the thing that people don't realize is that you're you're effectively moving 24 hours a day. Whatever situation you're in and whatever point you're in, like whatever chair you're in, how you're sleeping, et cetera, like you're forming your body and how it should be moving. And so that depends like how you're sitting throughout the day or standing or whatever. And like even people going from, you know, a seated desk to a standing desk think that, oh, now, you know, sitting is a new smoking. Now I'm standing. So I'm going to be good. Well, you have, you have problems with standing as well. The problem isn't sitting. The problem is being sedentary. And standing is also sedentary to, right. to a majority of the degree. And so I think for me, the concept of movement is there's a lot of stuff with your physical body that, that one should focus on. And I think it really depends on like where you're at. And again, looking at your health history. So if you're somebody who's done yoga for your entire life, but hasn't done a lot of strength training, you probably need to balance that out a little bit. Same thing with like if you have eaten a lot of carbs and nutrition, you maybe want to switch to eating ketogenic diet for a little bit or like pulling them back so your body can use both of these fuel systems. And so I think about movement as you know, flexibility slash mobility and control of your joints and control of your body. I think that yoga and a lot of those things address that really, really well. But then strength and power are another side of that that I think a lot of people do not look at. Seriously, especially women. I think that men and women are sort of diametrically opposed here where men do not look at flexibility or control of their joints or, or, or their joint positioning where women are fantastic about that. Um, but then men really go for strength and power. Women don't have any of that. And so I think that like wherever you're at, and of course, there's, a, there's those that sort of buck that trend, but balancing that out is key. Um, and then also like adding in some ability to, to have some aerobic work in there. I think that this is like really simple stuff, but you know, strength and power, flexibility, mobility, um, body weight control, which is like, I'm doing a lot of gymnastics work myself. I've, I've one who has not, I'm one of those like classic guys who's like never done any yoga or anything like that. So I'm trying to catch up by doing a lot of dedicated gymnastics work now. Um, and then a lot of aerobic work on top of that. And like aerobic work, this is where you can start getting into a lot of different things around how you approach it. Um, but just like having those fundamentals of every week, like am I getting in these things? Like every day, am I doing at least 30 minutes of one of those three things? I think it's really important. It's awesome. Yeah, I feel like I have had and have personally dealt with hypermobility based on yoga. And I came, oh, from, totally, being, yeah. came from being a soccer player that had like, you know, I had to actually lift weights as part of by like being on the team and that strength so energizing um, to the body. And so if you just get into one thing, which I got sucked into yoga because I love it. Like I just, it makes me so happy. It's sort of like dancing on a mat and it's great music and it feels really good to stretch like that. But yeah, you definitely can have problems with hypermobility and, and not have the strength to hold you in the right position. And so that's like, I love that you're talking about that because we can be, like singularly focused when it comes to working out um, and with food. So it's, I feel like it's almost like you're asking people to, to consider like the, the yin to their yang, if you will. Totally. Yeah. And good. Think, so looking back at my clinic and the frequency of injuries that I saw from yoga, it was actually the number one source of, of, of musculoskeletal pain that I saw in my clinic was from doing yoga. And like you're talking about of having too much motion in joints. Mm-hmm. The body's supposed to like sort of have this alternating um, stable versus mobile joints. And what happens is a lot of times people push through positions and make joints too lax and don't have the strength to be able to control those joints through motion. Um, and so your body, you, know, you need to like really have these complex movement patterns that we just don't develop as we age as a society anymore. Because as soon as we can walk, we're putting shoes that transform our feet into really weird things. And then we sit in chairs that aren't meant for whatever. And so... Like our movement patterns don't develop the same way. And if they do, we're robbed of them after we're, we're you know, four or five years old. And so working on those consistently and having the strength to move your joint through a range of motion is actually extremely rare. 
And so when you take a joint, you don't know how to move it. You don't know how to control it for a range of motion, but then you push it to end range and keep pushing it to end range. You're going to have problems and get pain. And that was number one for sure. Number two is triathletes. Number three was CrossFitters. So sort of like, I think opposite of what people would expect. You yeah, know. They, they didn't expect that list to be op- backwards, <laughs> starting yeah. with CrossFit, but I could totally see how it's, you're seeing it more with hyper, hypermobility. Oh, this is so awesome. Well, what, uh, what advice do you have for someone trying to get better sleep? I think we'll, we'll, we'll close up with sleep and what you, you know, what you think body love means to you. Yeah. So sleep is something that I actually just wrote about this in my newsletter yesterday, which is, you know, somebody asked me, you know, should I take melatonin for sleeping? And what I see a lot of times is people try to go with these things that put them to sleep instead of setting up their environment to guide them into a sleepy state. And so this is how I think about, you know, again, this is sort of the natural state of a human being. Like we have all of the, like er, everything, even nocturnal species have these re- regulatory effects that are guided by nature that allow them into a sleepy state where you recover. And I think that we've changed our environment so much that we need these artificial stimuli like melatonin and other sleeping s- supplements to be able to shut down at night. I think the biggest things are getting away from screens. I think that this blue light into your eyes is just a very unnatural thing, especially after when the sun starts setting in the sky. So I try to remove all screens. If, and if I can, I, I wear those nerdy blue blocking glasses to remove the blue light from my, from my eyes. Like I think that the, the signal of light is one of the biggest things. And then at home, we have um, Hue lights that are installed, in the HUE Philips Hue lights that you can program with the sunset. And so as the sun sets, they turn more orange and then all the way to red when the sun is down. So that's like sort of modifying your environment to remove light, light exposure and then blackout curtains that shut out all the city light. And then on top of that, I think that having a cool bedroom and being, you know, having some variation of temperature throughout the day is, an, is another one that really, really changes things for people. But I think like the light thing is, is by far the biggest thing. Um, and that, so I even stack on a eye mask on top of the blackout curtains on top of the <laughs> Q lights. Um, so I'm pretty particular about all this stuff. But yeah, I mean, I think like thinking about your environment and how it's set up more so than thinking about what you're adding in, in to your routine. And then also having a, having a shutdown routine. I think people's lives, especially right now, are so stressful. And the stress is manufactured not from your environment. It's manufactured from external stimuli. So right. news stories, work. Like, I'm, there's a lot of reasons for people to be stressed right now. A lot of people probably have lost their job who are listening to this and, and don't know when they're going to get their next paycheck, don't know when life's going to return back to normal. And I think having some sort of system, whatever works for you, I tend to use journaling about an hour before I go to bed to just like anything that like I just sit sit with whatever's in my head and get all these monkey mind thoughts out of my brain and write them down, especially all the things that are stressing me out. Things like, oh, should I have to do this tomorrow or that? And getting that out on paper and just having a list of things and then doing some movement, calming down and really having a relaxed like hour before you're going to bed. And like... Uh, uh, out of routine again, we we're talking about routines earlier. It's like the the consistency of going to bed at the same exact time every night. It's huge, and it's basically. I mean, a month ago, I don't know how you responded to daylight savings time, but it rocked me for like a week. It's brutal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the same thing happens if you go to like you, you're imposing a daylight savings fatigue on yourself if you're switching up your routine every night. Right. If you're switching up, you know, okay, I'm going to go to bed at, at ten tonight, eleven tomorrow, then nine the night after, like. This is a recipe for disaster from from a sleeping schedule perspective. So, like having your routine, controlling the light, and then really sticking to, towards like whatever works for you to de stress at night is is pretty big. I love it. You know what? You're going to be a phenomenal dad if that day ever comes because a kid on a sleep schedule with a sound machine or like a dark yeah, room well, at the exact also, same time in a full daily routine, it's. That's like, that is a recipe for the happiest, most creative type of a little kid. So uh, I'll, be, I'll be really excited yeah, for you when I'm that sure time I'll, comes. I'm sure, I'll get a, <laughs> I'm sure I'll get a challenge and I'll get the one baby in the world who like thrives on chaos. Yeah, no, it's good. It'll be fun. Um, all right. So I end every podcast now. I guess it's like a new thing, but it's been really fun um, because I'm getting a bunch of different answers. But what does body love mean to you? Good question. I think to me, what it means is figuring out what you want for yourself 
and only compare and like having a, a path of growth, but not comparing yourself to other people. There's just a lot of times right now, especially with social media, that people are seeing somebody else that has a certain physique, you know, drives a certain car, has a certain relationship, has whatever else they don't want. And doesn't look at where they're at and where they can go and where their next step is. They just think, ooh, I want to be that, like that person or have what that person has. And I think that that is really, really suffocating. And a lot of times, it might not even be possible. And so I think that like, just looking at where you're at, like, look down, look down at your feet and see like, what's the next step that I can go. And being obsessed with just walking the path from wherever you are to wherever you go. And wherever you go is totally fine. You're in control of that. And you know, don't judge where you're at. Just judge like, am I taking a step today? Am I taking a step tomorrow? And going wherever you want to go. I love that. Focusing on your journey and being totally. obsessed with it. Really, really good stuff. Anthony, it's been such a pleasure. It's so easy to talk to you. And I know that um, today's episode will give people the tools they need to get into ketosis if they'd like to and a way greater understanding on what it is in general. I think the misinformation is out there, but you really cleared it up today. And I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Yeah. So where can people follow along? Where can they find you? Where can they buy your book? Yeah, book is on Amazon. Check it out there. It's called Keto Answers. Um, I have a weekly newsletter called The Feed. You can get it at com slash The Feed. And then respond to all messages. If you have any questions, just reach out to me on Instagram at dranthonygustin. Yeah, you're a fun follow. So if you guys aren't following along, go, go find him and follow along. Well, thanks for being here. I appreciate your time so much. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Be Well by Kelly. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at bewellbykelly.com and follow me on Instagram at bewellbykelly. I would love if you picked up my books, Body Love and Body Love Every Day. They're sold on Amazon and at all major booksellers. 